you know, talk a little bit about, because I, I think that what's so important is something that um, uh, Nafisa spends a lot of time with is how the sinuses and the health of the teeth and the sinuses can affect the brain. Because that's something you know we have, just for a little background, you know, we work with dementia, but we really got there by working with people with chronic illness who almost always present with quote unquote brain fog, which is, <laughs> I like to say, a temporary dementia state where, you know, you work, I mean, you know, your ability to, for executive function is limited sometimes. Um, well, and if you're lucky, it's a temporary dementia state, right? For a lot of people who start to notice that they <laughs> have been told so many times by well-meaning neurologists that, you know, there's not a lot that we can do if you're losing your memory or if you don't have that executive function. So they hide it or they cope or they find strategies to work around it. And if they are lucky, they end up in the hands of doctors like you guys, where you have real solutions. So, you know, the society spends billions of dollars looking for Alzheimer's drugs. Yeah. And you guys have kind of stumbled on what, not really, I mean, you've worked very hard to figure out what, what helps with complex chronic disease, but you didn't come there from the perspective of trying to reverse beta amyloid plaque formations and what the drug is for that, right? You came at, at it from this perspective and you guys are just such a great complement to each other, you know, with the naturopathic background and then decades of, of the medical MD background and kind of merging those two in this really beautiful way that you are seeing, you know, what can happen when you support health. And so, yeah, Dr. Nafisa, I'd love to hear just some of the, some of the patients that you've seen, how they typically present and yes, dive into the sinuses because these infections are so important when it comes to cognitive health. Absolutely. So most of our patients come in after they've seen many other doctors. A lot of them have been to John Hopkins, they've been to Stanford, they've been to many local doctors and doctors far away and, and, and they've had thorough workups and, and great treatments, but they're still in a difficult place with regards to their health and, and they, they, they need a deeper dive. So, so they present after having been to many doctors and with their symptoms still dominant. And so of course, brain fog is a major one. Um, People might say, I, I just I feel like I'm, I, I'm just forgetting everything. I'm, I, I'm forgetting my, I have, uh, why I went to the store. I'm forgetting um, what I went to pick up. I'm forgetting where I put my keys. I'm forgetting the names of, of someone I met yesterday at a party. And now that we've opened up a little bit more in COVID, right? And, but, but people are forgetting things. They come in with body aches and pains and, and they come in um, with their neurological system in a little bit of a disarray. Uh, they might have neuropathies or tremors or a lot of headaches, um, migraines, and um, inevitably they have a lot of sinus infections. So, and, and they, they come in feeling stuffy very often. So this is our, our typical patient. They also have a lot of GI issues. So where I'm going with this is that if there, we know there's a, there's a strong connection between the gut and the brain. Of course, we know that um, toxins can travel from the gut via the vagus nerve up to the brain and toxins meaning biotoxins um, or uh, mycotoxins from funguses and, and inflammation can travel up that way across the blood brain barrier, but I'm tying it into the sinuses because I think that the sinuses are often um, forgotten about. The, the gut, the microbiome has been the sexy thing to look at in, in functional medicine, right? And, and, and I treat the sinuses much like I'll treat the gut. So in the gut, we have beneficial bacteria. We have bacteria that are pathogenic and um, inflammation from those pathogenic bacteria and, and most functional medicine doctors know how to treat the gut really well. So um, the sinuses, I believe are overlooked. So going back to Dr. Ali Reza Panapur's um, diagram of, of, the, of the nervous system in, in the head, <laughs> in, the, in the face, it, it's pretty amazing. I think more people should look at that diagram. I wish I had it here with me but um, I'll refer people back to that, that talk. 
um, at my summit so that they can see what I'm talking about. But there's the olfactory nerve um, in, in our face behind our sinuses and, and it travels right up to the brain. And so infections, mycotoxins, inflammatory cytokines, they have access to the brain via the olfactory nerve, just like all those same things have access to the brain via the vagus nerve. And so now we have at least two places simultaneously affecting the brain. One of the places very often overlooked with regards to treatment, the sinuses, another place commonly looked at now, the gut. So um, treating the sinuses is important. I'll, I'll I'd love to hear how you test for a sinus, what's going on in the sinuses. How do you know? Yeah, I, I like to use um, the test by, what are they called? They're called diagnostic solutions? No, micro, no micro, microbiology thank dia, you, Eric. diagnostics. Yeah, microbiology yeah. diagnostics. And it's a, it's a sinus swab. It feels a lot like a COVID test. No fun. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so we can, we can look at different bacteria on their um, funguses, biofilm. So um, it's a great test. Yeah. It gives us an idea who to treat uh, more aggressively or, you know, because some it, it, it's, you know, for a long time, uh, our world was obsessed with um, the, the staph, the Marcons, the, the, the resistant staph infection. And, you know, we've learned that that doesn't always tell us who to treat, you know, I mean, it, it uh, and this lab gives us also a measurement of the biofilm. And then I think increases the likelihood that treating those people are going to help. But, um, you know, but I think the way Dr. Parpia handles things, or, yeah, Nafisa, it's always funny calling you Dr. Parpia, but not <laughs> being formal for the moment, um, the, is, is realizing how much also the clinical presentation you know, is that if somebody has so many people um, don't realize that a stuffy nose is not a normal thing, you know, and it's not like, well, they just have, you know, and we also looking, of course, for allergies and things of that sort. But, you know, when you kind of subtract that out, that chronic stuffy nose is not normal, you know, and that often means that there's chronic inflammation. See, the, the medical world thinks in terms of infection. Okay, and what people have to understand that infection um, is when your system is all on, is overwhelmed. But in chronic inflammation, the bug is living there, and you're not overwhelmed. You're in a little bit of a symbiotic relationship, but your your immune system isn't acting well enough to keep the 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 bug like really quiet, you know, or the bug is just aggravating your immune system enough. You know, it, 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 and that's the problem. It's not that the bug is causing damage often, okay? Most of the time, it's just the inflammation that that bug is triggering, that low level, that's then causing problems in your brain. Because, I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, I, I think, um, well, I, I, the neurologists still don't agree, but I think those of us in the field <laughs> believe that inflammation is the cause of, you know, dementia on all levels, you know? I mean, like the end state is inflammation. You get there by many different pathways, you know? But that end stage of inflammation and, um, you know, and what, uh, what Nafisa has, has done is by treating people, you know, uh, more, more aggressively and persistently with natural things often, you know, we're able to change this. You know, because again, we started off, I mean, this is like that dance of the MD and the naturopath dance is that, I mean, our, I said the MD training is, um, is to be an expert in what I call band-aid medicine. We go in and we fix something quick, but, and when we depend on this black box of healing, you know, the body to come in and take over and when that doesn't work, we're kind of left looking at it and we just get more and more band-aids. And that's why, you know, all the treatment of autoimmune diseases and even, you know, um, dementias are all about band-aids. They're trying to fix the damage. They're not trying to figure out what's caused the damage, you know, right. and, you know, and, and so anyway, and so what, what Nafis is doing is working to lower the inflammation and in, without causing too much disruption 
because you know I'll you know we originally went in there with lots of antibiotics, which sometimes we still need to do, but most of the time we can do it with more natural, more natural approaches that allow the system to lower the inflammation and heal. And I think that's. I love it. You guys do such a good job at asking that question. That question, like this is the this is the important question. It's not, you know the diagnosis, this fancy word that's really important to come up with, but it's the why, why dementia, why inflammation, how did we get there? And so unraveling that is where it kind of gets a little messy sometimes, and particularly in the realm of infections, right? Because some people interpret one lab one way, other people interpret other labs another way. Sometimes the labs aren't just really aren't that great yet. With infections, we really have to ask the question, does this patient have strep? Does this patient have Marcon's? Does this patient have Borrelia. So you have to have an idea in mind about what infection might be there. So how do you navigate all of this when you have a complex patient in front of you? History. <laughs> and lots of labs, both. Yeah, both. But you know, I, I, I guess the thing we have to remember is that we all, we all love labs because we're all looking for a clear answer. And you know, occasionally we're lucky um, we get clear, clean answers. But again, with chronic illness, we're dealing with the body's response to the infection, not the infection. I think that's the big differential in why medicine in general has done such a poor job. Because what, as a medical doctor, you know, when I think of infection, we think of like a pneumonia or, you know, a bronchitis or a strep throat. When there's a clear cut bug we can find and a clear response, we treat and it goes away, okay? But when you've done that and the person only recovers like 70%, you kind of, you know, like we're trained, well, you know, it, the bug is no longer clearly there. You don't wanna keep treating. And so we just let people go on. But, but getting back to that point is that now it's about how your immune system is able to either totally eradicate the bug or realize that it succeeded. Because many times it's the immune system remains upregulated or dysregulated and creating inflammatory chemicals. And that can go on for years. We forget the body can reach a new balance point, you know, where it now accepts that there's a level of inflammation because it thinks it still needs to contain an infection you know, or some of those old proteins are there or like with the viruses, you know, many, many people are, um, you know, uh, you know, the Epstein-Barr and the HH6 and cytomegalovirus. These are, these are viruses that actually become part of our B cells. I mean, that's the problem is that they're herpes family viruses and they can get in and they stay with us, but our immune system keeps them suppressed. But every once in a while, you'll express a little bit of it. And we've learned this in the chronic fatigue world um, back in the early 2000s that about 30% of people with chronic fatigue actually do respond to um, antiviral drugs, but that's only 30%. So that gets ignored in medicine, you know? And it doesn't, and so I, I don't wanna belabor this point, but this is what makes it so important is using the judgment to looking at the tests, looking at the patients, and sometimes, um, you know, now that we have some new testing that uses like T cell markers, so we can get a little better idea, is this an active infection? In the past, we were limited to immune globulin markers, you know, these IgGs uh, and IgAs and IgMs. And these are, these are especially the IgGs with some of these infections are going to last a lifetime. So they don't tell us whether this is going on now and I hope these new T cell tests are better able to tell us whether it's active and um, whether treatment is, is useful. But that's just, I said, for the viral component and for Lyme and the tick-borne diseases, it's the same mess, okay? And, um, you know, so again, it's symptoms and that's where it helps that people treated this for a long time. Because if you haven't, um, I say one man's, you know, people are often lo looking online for lists of symptoms. And, you know, those are helpful. But again, those symptoms are often not from the bug, but from how your body responds to the bug. Actually, I want to jump in yes, here please. because 
because um, what I've noticed is that a lot of these illnesses, a lot of these different diagnoses, when someone's had them for a long time, the symptoms are going to start to mimic each other. So someone walks in, they've had Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, mold illness, mycotoxin illness, and a high environmental toxicant load. That could mean they have high glyphosate or high metals in their system or high, high other chemicals in their system. And, um, and, they, and they say, well, which one is it? Well, first of all, it's the combination of everything. But the second thing is that when someone's been sick for a while, it's not so much about the inciting event or, oh, did, did just the Lyme cause this or did just the Babesia or just the Bartonella cause this? It's that the body, the body starts to create inflammation as, as Dr. Gordon was saying here and, and, and it starts to create its own pathway of, of how that's gonna represent in each individual based on their, their, their weak links that they already have. And so it's not so much about the bug anymore as it is about the person and, and how their body's handling that inflammation. So we can remove the arrows as, as Eric likes to say, right? Remove the arrows meaning we can pull the different bugs that we're gonna kill them. And of course, we're gonna do that. We, we kill those infections and we're gonna detoxify them. We're gonna pull out the chemicals. And sometimes the person, not sometimes, very often, 80% of the time in, in our patients who have complex chronic illness, they're still gonna feel sick. They're still gonna have those symptoms even though the inciting events have been pulled out. And that's what, what he's talking about, that, that why. So, so the first piece of our treatment is, is detoxifying the patient, modulating their immune system, killing infections. The second portion is about regenerative medicine and how we're going to, to heal the systems that have been insulted by the infections and the toxins and the stress and the diet. Yeah, and I just yeah. wanna reemphasize your point, which I think is so crucial, is that in my earlier career, we, we focused on killing the bugs, okay? And again, I call that going through the front door. But if you have chronic illness, that's usually not the best way to go. Okay. And that's where, you know, Nafisa and 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 the naturopathic approach of detoxing first. Because then oftentimes we need to use little or sometimes no antibiotics or, or, and, you know, or drugs because the body, you know, again, most people have these infections and do fine and are able to clear them on their own. It's this persistent toxicity that we have seen, uh, you know, and, and what, you know, there's so many possibilities um, because uh, unfortunately the, the world has changed so much in the last 40 years, you know, between, um, you know, we have uh, the chemical levels, that are huge, including the herbicides and the pesticides. And in the last 20 years, now the glyphosate, um, the EMF has gone through the roof um, and the vaccines, not that I said, <clears throat> I've gotten my vaccine. I'm not, it's not that we're against vaccines, but giving children 30 or 40 so close together is too much information for the immune system. You know, they're, it, 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 that, that's what makes me so sad. I won't go into the vaccine world, but I think we, we're unable to discuss the pros and cons. It's not, they are really powerful. They are life-saving. They're not bad. We need the vaccine. It's just but. modulating. But anyway, but that's, but unfortunately we've lost that opportunity. We've now become, there's no conversation that's allowed. So it's frustrating, but, but anyway, but getting, but the point is, I don't know which one of these um, areas you know, uh, are, are affecting immune function, but something is, because I can tell you, and, and many doctors and people are writing about it, but those of us who've been in practice for as long as I have, we have seen the difference, okay? We just didn't see this number of young, sick people. They weren't out there, you know? Uh, you didn't have the level, besides it's allergies, all the Hashimoto's, all the thyroid disease in young people, it was just, you know, and the brain fog in young people. Oh, 
God. I mean, yeah. it's huge. Yeah, we just didn't see these things. So something is contributing. It's very hard. I mean, you, you epidemiology, like, you know, looking for, for populations and changes in, um, you know, in, 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 in environment, you really can't get a, a, a one-to-one correlation, but we can say something has changed. And what we can see is that when we detox people and we help their bodies um, work better, a lot of symptoms improve dramatically. You know, and I'm sure, you know, working, you know, with, with more with people with dementia, you see that day in and day out is that the detox is is really the key, you know. It's so validating to have this conversation because I see exactly the same thing that you guys are seeing and in the dementia space, but also in the mold space and the in the chronic complex disease space that people come in, they've been sick forever, they haven't been detoxified, or there's something else standing in the way. And Eric, this is what you had said, is that it's not necessarily the infection because these infections are relatively ubiquitous. A lot of people are exposed, but only some people get get symptoms. And COVID has been this absolutely like very impressive illustration of this, right? That some people have zero symptoms, other people die. Other people end up with the long haul COVID. And what's the difference? right? What's the difference between those people? And maybe if we can identify that, we can understand a little bit more about how to be in the category of people that doesn't have persistent symptoms. And you guys have been doing that for decades. So the, that was my question. And I think Nafisa, you started to answer it is, okay, what's standing in the way? Toxicity, for sure. I'm curious if you guys have also noticed, I see a pattern of early childhood trauma being uh, really affects how sensitive people are to these infections and exposures. What what else stands in the way? And when you see it, what do you do about it? Yeah. I, I'm just going to throw in one thing. It's a little bit of an aside. I'll go, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, you know, I think early childhood trauma is very important, but it's really the person more than the. I mean, people don't like to, to hear this, but th- there's. Um, when Dr. Navio, I, I think he's published this, um, looked at um, post-traumatic st- stress disorders in 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 Marines and Navy and Navy off a Navy um, military that were um, sent to Iraq and Afghanistan, I, um, he could see that you know by the metabolomics before and, and you know and after they were deployed, the metabolomics before they were deployed could determine that about the 10% of people who are at high risk for PTSD, okay? So we enter sensitized and then the traumatic mm-hmm. event will set us off, okay? But you know, this is, cause I, I've been, uh, my whole life I've always been, I, I've been interested in the Holocaust and, and in like, you know, what makes people survive. And, and you can see people from war torn areas. They, I mean, the, the terror and the horrors that people go through and that many come out fairly okay. And some people come out not, and it, it has a lot to do with our biochemistry and how we, uh, how our immune system, because it is our immune system, you know, fear is a, you, you know, every um, emotion, can, you know, like you've got uh, serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors and all these, you know, uh, receptors for mood states on all your immune cells. Okay. There's no difference. So it's how the body modulates that response, whether it's to a bug or to an abusive situation, okay? And it, it, it tends to go together, you know? Um, and so we have to learn to support that. I mean, it's just another trigger that we have to realize that the more we can support the physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects, because we're all, you know, it makes a huge difference. So you are right that that early childhood trauma is a great driver, but it's a driver because it causes persistent inflammation because it causes fear, mm-hmm. fear, and that causes self-protection. What self anxiety is a way to protect yourself. You know, worrying about what's around you is what you do to protect yourself. Now, like most reactions in the body, when it keeps going, it no longer serves, okay? You know, you die of COVID usually because your immune system over, overstepped its bounds. You know, it's not the bug. The virus doesn't kill you. It's your immune response that kills most people. Okay. Um, 
And it's the same thing. Anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder is just, you're trying to protect yourself. And well, how, I, I love this conversation. This is amazing and, and totally mind blowing for me because I haven't thought about it in that way before. And so this kind of chicken and egg conversation of like, so where, where did it start? And what, how do we unravel these things so that people can live their optimal potential? Yeah, we support everything you can support. If, you're, if you are a person who tends to um, uh, anxiety or OCD, you have to spend more time be- hopefully before you get ill, practicing whatever works, whether it's, it's, whether it's exercise, meditate, hopefully a combination of things, meditation, breathing, you have to learn how to soothe your body better. A lot of times these people need support from, from healers, people who are healers and body workers, um, from um, indigenous wisdom, from their own, um, their own family, in family line of spirituality, um, we find that, that that really helps people. And some people, um, they might not have that. So they meditate and, and they just put their feet in the earth and they, they ground themselves. So different people have different ways, different points of access to yeah. that place, I think. Yeah. But Connect, connection to the earth. I mean, you just, that, that that is it. You know, no matter how sick you are, if you can get some time to actually sit on the ground, I mean, if you're able to, and be in the sun or hold a tree, sit in it. I mean, these are the simplest things to do, but they can be um, life-changing. You know, and I know it's hard for people to believe that when you're lying in bed or you can't think straight or you're in pain, you know, these all sound like platitudes, okay? But they're not, they physically change your body. You know, it's... And, and then your emotions change. It, it, it's, it's a state changes. It, it, it works. Um, it's yeah. so powerful. And when we're talking to someone who's highly sensitive, that's something they can do, right? Many people who I work with, I'm sure who you work with, are so sensitive that the thought of taking a supplement or changing their food because it's already so limited, these are just not options. And so when we can start to talk about these lifestyle things like getting your feet in the sand or the water or in the grass, there's a, there's a window, there's an opening there for up an opportunity to heal. And right. that's where all those limbic retraining programs work. You know, there are many of them out there now, you know, um, the Gupta, Annie Hopper, and there are several others I forget now that people, because people have to look for ones that resonate with them, Right. you know, because to be honest, I'm the kind of personality that some of those require too much intensity and focus to do well. But luckily, many of the people who tend to more OCD have that so they can do those programs, but they will work. They begin to lower the charge because the story that we tell ourselves controls our immune response. I mean, this is what people have to understand is that for years they were insulted by doctors who told them that it was all in their head. Okay. And so understandably, that's insulting when you're really sick. But on the other hand, our head our brain does control a lot. And when we get that power, we can begin to settle down the immune system. And as our immune system gets happier, we can maybe quiet it down in our gut. So our food choices can become more generalized. And then we get more information, our microbiome gets better. It feeds back to our little brain and we begin to move. But again, many times it has to be with sitting outside, getting some sun, you know, getting some walking, if you can, if you have enough energy walking, I mean, rhythmic motion, uh, as, as Nafisa was saying, that ancient, you know, ancient cultures before hierarchy, you know, just really had the way, but we've lost it because, you know, our cultures are more about keeping hierarchy than they are about finding your joy. Mm-hmm. Okay, finding your own joy is not something that is really honored you know, we honor sacrifice and sacrifice should be there for the other, but we should also find our own joy. So we're really offering something, <laughs> you know, not, not offering our pain, but offering our joy and being willing to work hard for the other. Anyway, oh, you know, when people are sick, a lot of them find it very hard to find joy 
um, and 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 so it's important to help them find ways because if it's there, it's inside it, it, each person. It, it resides deep in our heart, but a lot of times people who are sick find it hard to access that because they're full of symptoms, physical symptoms, mental, emotional symptoms, and and sometimes they need it, somebody to guide them to find that place. We do work with our patients yeah. that way. Um, and and we, ha we have healers as well that will, that will have our patients yeah. work with. It's, I just want to acknowledge that because it- Oh, well, we just, I mean, just yeah. for my own life, I can see how easy I can go into a story of, okay. of, of suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. we, we, we just, I mean, it's two things, self-righteousness and suffering are two things that um, the mind seems to really enjoy, <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, I'm right and you're wrong is one of my favorite places. And, and then, oh my God, I have wronged you and, uh, and I can do that really, really well. And it's, a, it's, it's a loop. You know, so it, it and, and I'm pretty healthy and I can sometimes have trouble getting out of that loop, you know, and, but if I listen to any of the teachers, you know, breathe, exercise, laugh, you know, you know, you can move out of that and, you know, um, and, you know, meditate, work with it, work with a healer, but it's still our natural, so I just want to be really gentle here with people is know that like, this is not easy. And once you're ill, again, that it, it can be, you know, finding joy sounds like another platitude. You know? But all the, all the magic in the world, right, is in that awareness, because it gives you the space to choose. And so learning how to become more aware, whether it's through Gupta or Annie Hopper or meditation or, or your spiritual path, um, that that's where so much of the stuckness can become unstuck and open up to that possibility of healing. You guys mentioned kind of phase one is finding the culprits, right? What's, what's, what's keeping you from getting up and over the infection or what's keeping you inflamed. And then phase two is rebuilding this regenerative state. So I want to understand a little bit more what you mean by that. Yeah. So um, we would use mitochondrial support at that time. A lot of times people come to me when they're really, really sick and they say support my mitochondria now. And well, I can, I can give them mitochondrial support till the cows come home, but if they're still highly infected and they're still highly, have a high toxin load, those are big insults to the mitochondria. So I'll do mitochondrial support in the next phase after I've killed off the infections. Um, peptide therapies work really well before we start to kill off infections, during the time of infection killing and detoxification, and even after. Um, um, biological allografts um, using regenerative medicine techniques can work as well. Um, things like exosomes, they have to be given at the right time. Um, and, and typically the right time is after um, as well. So, yeah. and, and we've seen those help with cognitive decline also. Typically, Me too. Yeah, typically with our patients, it is, it is in that the patients who are sick with complex chronic illness, it is in that second phase of treatment, which I call the regenerative medicine phase, that their memories really start to come back. Now in my, I have a bunch of patients as well who, um, who are from Silicon Valley and they're sharp and, and they're, you know, they're at the top of their game in every way, but they come to me when they're in their mid forties and they say, you know, I'm starting to get, um, tired and I'm beginning to lose my memory. I'm a little bit worried about myself. It's not so bad. I can hide it. Just a few people might notice it. Um, what do I do here? Right. And so in giving them early phase treatment, because they're not sick, kill off some bugs. I find those, find some toxins, pull them out, um, treat their sinuses. Inevitably they've got issues in their sinuses and they're done. They're done really quickly. Quickly means three to six months. Could be their gut as well. But so a lot of times, very, very sharp people will come into our clinic because we're, we're in the Bay Area. So 
So we'll attract those people. So, you know, they'll, they'll come and they're worried about themselves when they're not so sick using the same techniques that we use. What a them. luxury, right? To be working on prevention, to be optimizing, not having to reverse a really complex, chronic, challenging disease where you do have multiple phases and months and months, if not years of treatment. Uh, I wish and I hope that our, these conversations will inspire people to start earlier when it's less expensive, it's less time consuming, it's less, less complex to address these issues. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because what, what's been so interesting is that, you know, when, when, um, when Dr. Bredesen's book came out, you know, I mean, like, it was just, I just went, huh? You know, I mean, like, this is what we've been doing, you know, I mean, for 30 years, this is what we've been doing. Um, and, but he put it together beautifully, <laughs> you know, and it was amazing to see like, oh, okay. Cause I, you know, and, and the ex expertise that we develop from treating people who've been really, really sick, we realized that it, it is really what mildly ill or people who are just beginning to have, um, functional issues, they all need, because again, the thing that made these chronic ill people chronically ill was their body's accommodation to inflammation and chronic infection. Actually, this goes back to, to Heather's first, not first question, but earlier question about what stands in the way, right? How does somebody get long haul COVID, for instance, when they've been well up until they got COVID? Or, um, you know, why are they why they're beginning to feel the cognitive decline at a young age and it's minor, what's underneath that? So it's often um, their hormones are, are beginning to change and we need to tweak that. They have a high stress response, um, but very often there's a subclinical infection. We're talking, we or the, again, the, the toxicity. toxicity. Because, you know, it, it is that the, the thing that our bodies mostly work really well. I mean, it's just amazing considering how much we have to deal with, you know, and that's where the gen looking at genetics, I find that genetic testing, I mean, it, it is still in its infancy. Um, there are several labs. I mean, I use uh, IntelliX DNA, I think does a good job because they, what I call curate the data, you know, because the data, I mean, this is something we were just chatting about before we went live is data. You know, we all love data, you know, but the problem we're facing in, in, um, cutting edge medicine, I guess we'll call it, is that we've got, um, you know, between the microbiome, um, the genomics, the transcriptomics, the, you know, we have all these omics, which gives us huge amounts of data, but we don't yet know what to do with it, you know, and um, people are now looking at AI and, 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 and for helping, um, and which is great, but, um, you know, the difficulty is um, using medical literature since literally, I mean, 20% of medical literature is just wrong. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, the, the actually there was just an article in, I think it was Lancet or the British Medical Journal the, uh, of um, British Medicine that, um, you know, just the, one of the heads of the Cochrane Reviews, he, you know, just said 20% of, of, of the articles are bogus. You know, they're bad data, they're false data. Anyways, I don't want to go over there. But the point is, is that it's hard to use AI for really um, treating people, but it's hopefully will, AI will help us begin to um, uh, discriminate people, you know, get, get a little bit more help. But getting back to that, but we do need, but the genomics has become a little more helpful in the last few years because there's more and more data, the problems, are you you know if you're um, Jewish or Chinese or white Anglo-Saxon, you got a pretty good shot because we got a lot of information on the genetics. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, um, you know if you're Afri African American, you know black, um, you know it, the data sets aren't that good yet. You know, it's just all about population groups. You know, but we're beginning, you know, to get somewhat useful data that again, it, it, having the gene doesn't do anything. You need, you know, except for maybe a few hundred genes, you know, there's a few hundred that, yeah, you got it, you got a problem. But anything that we're talking about, usually you need like 50 or a hundred genes to be blinking. 
Um, I really appreciate what Dr. Sharon Hausman Cohen has done. And um, she is also, if, if you are listening to this and interested in the genetics and how that might relate to your dementia or your loved one's dementia, please have a, head over to her talk and get the download on how important genetics can be in this scenario. I think you bring up such a great point, Eric, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Nafisa, as a naturopath, right? It's like common sense, but uncommon practice. We throw so much money at making things more and more complex when the foundations are so critical. And as a society, we're just not doing it, right? We're not getting healthy food. We're not getting enough sleep. We're not getting enough exercise. We're not taking, we're not managing our stressors. We're totally burdened by toxins. We're not, a lot of people aren't pooping enough or drinking enough water or sweating enough to be getting them out, even though we're inundated with them. And so, kind of going back to those foundational pieces, which you guys have talked about in the context of like a medical crisis, we can also do that just each and every one of us to help promote health. Absolutely. For our, for our patients who are quite sick, that's an, those are such, a, such important foundations, diet, lifestyle, stress, water, organic food, um, grounding on the earth. What they do is set the stage for the therapies that we give them to work. So we give people a lot of um, IV therapies. It might be IV antibiotics if they have tick-borne illness. It might be IV detoxification therapies or IV oxidative therapies um, to help kill off infections, including viruses. But if, if those foundations aren't set, then all the cool therapies we're going to give them are just just going to fall through the cracks. So, for our patients, that is that, that piece has to be set. Um, our patients who with complex chronic illness, for the patients who are here because they want to optimize, it's very often that that is that is going to make their treatment with us um, be three months long instead of six months long. You know, yeah. so they can use food and food as medicine at that point. Yeah, when they're not too sick. Yeah, but it, it, it's again. I mean, I, I, the socioeconomic thing has been just driving me crazy because I started off, you know, treating you know farmers out in in, in northern New York, in upstate New York, and um, you know, it, it's just the availability of organic food makes such a difference. I mean, if you, when you travel and you see the difference of how we get to eat here in Northern California, or you probably in San Diego, compared to what's available just day in and day out, you know, it, it, and it, it's just, it's mind boggling how well people actually do considering how inflammatory diets they're eating. You know? It makes me just want to pull my hair out and kick and scream and then work harder, I guess. But when you see like these drugs, like the aducanumab that came out recently with this $56,000 oh. price tag for dementia, and you think like, what could we do with $56,000 per person with dementia? We could get them some really good food. We could get them some really great physical therapy or, or exercise, you know, somebody to help them with exercise. We could get them a one-on-one -on -one caregiver to just like rub their hand and arms and like give them some love. There's so many things that we could do to invest. Yeah. But you can't do a double blind placebo controlled trial on these things. <laughs> and therefore we can't get any respect that these work because we are stuck in that model. I mean, it's a great model. If you're going to, if you're going to give a drug that's going to cost $50,000 a year, you'd like to have really robust data. So, okay, I'll go with the double blind placebo controlled trial. Or if the drug is going to have a, you know, five or 10%, you know, significant, you know, um, side effect rate that's going to get people really sick. Yeah, we really want to be sure. But if we're going to give people good food and good love <laughs> and, and, and touch, you know, I don't think we need a double blind placebo controlled <laughs> trial. We can, let's just do, um, you know, let's just treat a bunch of people because it's, you know, we have experience. We, we it's like, we pretend that we don't know anything. Well, you this know? model, this model of double blinded placebo controlled trials, it's almost like the inflammation, right? It, it's kind of similar, the chronic inflammation, like it's, it doesn't serve us anymore. 
our, our issues are too complex. Our issues are, are too chronic that this double-blinded placebo-controlled kind of medical reductionism has gotten out of control to a point where at one point it did serve us perhaps, but now it doesn't. We got to get rid of it. I mean, or we need to use it in the, like inflammation, we need to use it in the ways that it serves us. Exactly. No, I mean, like we need to know that things, interventions that have significant downsides, I want to do, because, you know, we have seen myself over the last 20, there are, I mean, in our world, there are so many therapies that come out. I call them the flavor of the month. You right. know? And, you know, and I try them, you know, if they're not going to hurt people, I, I'm a great believer because, you know, they might work in anywhere from 10 to 50% of people. And if I hit that right 10%. It's wonderful, but they're not toxic. Okay, I can do that. But I also know that um, if they were toxic, we really should do better trials of- but You mean a toxic potential. A toxic potential to, to patients. Yeah. And, and that is where we need to learn to get that. But the academic physicians are so stuck. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot tell you, I, I talk to these guys and I work with them occasionally and I, I, I respect them, but- you know, because one of their big points, which is very true, is the plural of, of, of anecdote is not data, you know, just because, you know, and so we have to be careful, but we shouldn't throw out, you know, but when you have a thousand anecdotes, I think you begin to get to the data level. And when you the know? anecdotes connect with common sense. <laughs> right, yeah, we, and we, we have to, we have to, we have to really respect that. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's just that, but it's a hard conversation because, um, you know, in the drug world, they've seen so many things that they thought worked that turned out that they don't. Um, but again, but they had significant side effects and cost. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about things that don't, and, and we, I would, it's hard to get this conversation going because it, it, it's a little, again, too much black and white in the world and people won't ex accept the gradations, but just before we, I know I'm wrapping up, but I'm just thinking what I just would like to emphasize for people is that um, we get to chronic inflammation probably on a fairly individual basis, you know, because to my mind, chronic inflammation is what drives most of the dementias, uh, you know, people, you know, like the, 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 that's why, you know, trying to fix the, the tau and the beta and, and the amyloid proteins, you know, isn't going to do much of anything because that's the end stage, you know, um, that's just your immune response, actually, you know, and just like people with APOE4s are all, you know, like, but, you know, APOE4 is a really good thing to have if you have a lot of parasites, you know, <laughs> you know, APOE4 is protective against, um, you know, a, a lot of infections. It's just that when you don't, um, when, when you don't modulate and you don't detox, it becomes a real, then, it, then it's a, a, a real negative, you know? Um, so it's just, uh, I think, hold on, we're learning a lot you know, and um, realize that going back to the basics of, of detox and working with doctors who know how to test you and not fall in love with the test, okay? Look at the patient. Just because you have a positive test doesn't mean you have to treat it, okay? If the, you know, you might, if the patient's asymptomatic in that area, go a step down deal with the, with, with what is maybe um, affecting the body's um, ability to modulate its own response to that infection, you know, and we're going to do far better than just treating the bug. Amazing. Okay. And, and, and the other thing I want to say is that a lot of the thing I love about a lot of what we call the oxidative therapies, the high dose vitamin C's and the ozone is that they're nonspecific it's not so much that they kill stuff, but they modulate the immune response. And we do have data on that. I mean, that's the point. There is really good data and we, you know, um, and it's modulation. I can't say it enough because some people need to turn it up and some people need to turn it down. Just getting back that intelligence of the system and, and the, the harmony, that homeodynamic state. Right. Yeah. Flexibility. Flexibility. I mean, like, that's really what ability to respond to your environment. That resilience. is health. health. I yeah. love it. The ability to respond to your environment. That is the definition of health. 
you know, it, yeah. it'll, you know, I mean, it, we all respond to it, yeah, but it's like, it's like being able to dance with it, you know, mm. not just fall down or, <laughs> or, 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 or be too rigid. Right. You know, I mean, that's the, the fluidity is what, mm-hmm. you know, body is motion, energy, it, it's all movement. And um, uh, our, our brain likes to make things into black and white pieces because we think better that way. You know, as Dr. Navio, um, the, the uh, doctor who really helped put together the concept of the cell danger response, he says, engineering thought is great in trauma, but it doesn't, it can't really understand the flexibility and, dyna- and dynamism of life. You know, mm-hmm. you have to like make things kind of into dead pieces, but you, but that's how our minds work. Yeah, you know, gotta like, simplify them a little bit to make sense of them. Yeah, which is, yeah. Which is good up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have to get back to that reverence, right? For how complex and incredible and amazing it can be. Eric Nafisa, it's absolutely just such a privilege, such a joy to see you guys and to get to have this conversation, to dive deep into the complexity of medicine and health and to hear some of the solutions that you are bringing to your very privileged patients. It's just a pleasure. I want to make sure everyone knows where they can find out more about you guys and your practice and also your summit. Oh, yes. Thank you. So you can find us at Gordon Medical. Dot com. And um, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're in Marin, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. And our summit is the Mycotoxin and Chronic Illness Summit, where we're so happy you spoke. Thank <laughs> you. It was such a pleasure to be there with you. Really, really fun. I love that we get to do this. And I can't wait to see you guys in person at the next Thank conference. You. The next yeah. deep dive into complex chronic illness and all of the solutions to it. Exactly. Looking- Thank you so much for having us. It was such a privilege, such an honor. Yes. So much fun. Thank you. It really was fun. I hope we really um, gave people a sense of that. There's a lot of possibility out there. I think that's the main thing. You know, you know, don't, don't think there's only one answer. There's lots of them.